And here we are, folks. It be Friday. It be the Michael Harding podcast. You're very welcome, wherever you are. In any part of the world, or in Ireland, most of my listeners are in Ireland, but I love the ones overseas just as much. Hello, Bordeaux. Friends over there, listening. And I'm going to talk about Buddhism. Haven't talked about Buddhism for about two or three weeks, and sometimes I need it. The thing about about Christian faith is that you kind of really fall into the narrative. You know, you fall into a kind of a sense of you're living with the God inside you. You're living with a sense of faith. You're. I met a woman the other day, and she was talking about going to mass. Now she'd be an artist, so like I'm saying that, in a sense, that seems unusual. You know, we expect modernity, art, all that to be sort of post-religious. To we've all woken up and we've gone beyond it. But you know, people certainly that I know are the same as they ever were in many respects. Uh, this woman, my own age, maybe a little bit younger, about sixty, and she's an artist, and she was saying how. Uh, the the priest wasn't using the microphone properly and so you couldn't hear what he was saying and it really frustrated her because she loved the Mass. Everywhere she goes, she loves going to Mass. It makes her feel rooted and grounded. She goes to you know, Germany or she goes to Poland or she goes to Spain or she goes to America and the first thing she'll do is find out where the Catholic Church is and she'll go in and she'll go to Mass and she feels grounded. And um, that's a ritual that you can explain and understand even if you're not exploring the metaphysical side. You know, forget about whether there is or not a God, but here's a woman who uses the ritual of faith, of expressing faith, in order to feel grounded. And I think it also gives her a sense of joy. And I met two people the other night as well. I was uh, travelling up to Dublin and and there were a couple that I know up there and they spend a lot of time abroad and we went out for a meal and, you know, something, I found them really heavy and tired and exhausted in themselves and I was worried about them and I felt, you know, what, what is it that they don't have? And I felt that at the end of the day when I was driving home, They've no joy in them because the way they look at the world is very joyless. And that may be okay. Like, it may be true that the world has fallen apart, that everything is terrible, that climate change is a disaster, that we're kind of heading for the cliff. It's just this sense that life is awful. And um, I'm reminded of what uh, somebody said. I think it was Primo Levi in the... In the concentration camp, I think he says it in that book, you know, his famous book, he can't put the title on it, if this is a man or something. But uh, he's talking about life in the concentration camp uh, in Auschwitz and meeting this other guy who used to wash every morning in the washroom, even though there was no water. And if there was an odd little bit of water, it was so dirty that you'd be dirtier after washing. And every morning your man used to wash. He would go through the motions of washing. And one day your ma- Levi said to him, um, why do you do that? And he said, we must remember that we are human. If we forget we are human, then they have won. And the ritual of washing was a ritual of being civilized and conscious and human and carrying with it in humanity, all the energy that is compassionate and caring for other people and forgiving and non-judgmental, whatever you want to say about what is beautiful to be human, that's that's what was happening, the remembrance of that when he was doing something that is civilized. And I was thinking about this couple that I met, as I say, in Dublin, and they're very civilized and they're they're beautiful, generous people, but They seemed exhausted and tired, and I felt they're actually exhausted and tired because they genuinely care and they genuinely look into the issues about uh, democracy and fracking and nuclear energy and patriarchy and 
the climate change that's happening and the fuel crisis and the war in the Ukraine and like everything they looked at everything was exhausting them and so it was it was leaving them with a sense of hopelessness and I says to myself on the way home I was thinking like what are they missing you know what what would help and the only answer I could come up with was faith and I thought about the woman as I say who she's an artist and she goes all over the world but whatever she goes she always likes to go to mass and it's not that she has conservative Catholic views. I think she doesn't. I mean, I think she'd be as modern as the rest of us. But she gets a sense of hope from that, a dynamic of hope from the ritual. From, from Because it's like saying, well, I believe in the best possibility of the human being. And to believe in the best possibility of being human is difficult if you're in Auschwitz, if you're in a concentration camp, I dare say, if you're in some of the concentration camps that exist currently in the world, in places like China or North Korea, or there are other places, I don't want to get too political, but if you're in some place like that, it must be difficult to you know, reach in your imagination for the highest level of what it is to be human, and yet it seems to me not that it's right to do it, but that it, it could be therapeutic to do it. And if it is true in those situations, like in Auschwitz, where Primo Levi talks about it, the remembrance of what it is to be human in a positive way, then I guess for somebody just living the ordinary life that you and me are living, and we're watching television and we're observing all the stuff about climate change and all the stuff about wars and all the stuff about the economy and and the culture wars and, and the way that everything seems to be wrong. And, and the last thing that seems to be acceptable is religious faith. And yet, religious faith might be the very thing that would get us through this. You know, that, that in, in hope, in the sense of hoping that the human species is the best imaginable template, then that would get us through that would improve things. So if, if I then look at what is the Christian template of to be human, we all start with the Gospels, the idea of thinking about somebody else, compassion for somebody else, right? Um, do to your neighbor as yourself and all the rest of it. But it's like putting the other person first. And, and that's what it's about, love. Now, if you go to the root of that, there's something else that's not often dealt with, I think, in Christian tradition, and that is the whole idea of creation, that it's the text where it talks about creating man in the image of God, and then it says, male and female, I created them. And that, to me, is is beautiful, but it's also like, it's also such an affirmation of feminism. Man is a generic term. When when you use this word man, it's like it's like you're inclusive of the female, male and female. But but the kind of idea that in a sense the two opposites, you know, is is the creation. And you get it in science, you get it in molecules, you get it in atoms, you get it in the whole construction of the universe. In physics, in quantum physics, you get this sense of one thing and the other thing. The zero and the one, the one and the zero. The opposites. And that kind of sense of opposites that are reaching for each other, that are kind of almost longing for each other. And that's like that's something you can say nearly about physics you know that the atoms are longing for each other well then it comes to the human beings and they long for each other yeah and i think this was this is okay you know if if we're going towards a whole new understanding of gender rather than sexuality i don't want to get into it too deeply again i don't want to be caught in controversies but i definitely think that it's not a problem 
in the sense that nobody's changing the idea of this sense of longing that that you know two people fall in love like whatever they are what whatever their kind of orientation i think that's a, a thing that irish people showed themselves tolerant about in the past 20 years in the few referendums that we had on those issues it's like it's not judging anybody but it's saying that the fundamental thing is love and maybe there is the one place that you might get a an argument at the dinner table where people would talk about the fundamental idea being oppression or or power that the kind of the movement is for power and control and then the other person gets oppressed and that kind of dynamic is what you get in some ways that people look at the history of economics or of the working classes or women or uh, colonial areas. So it's like the dynamic is is hinging around power and and also the idea that knowledge is the power so that all knowledge is not not just neutral but it's a kind of manipulation of power you get into a whole conversation about i suppose i would say fairly you know hopeless and despairing ways to look at the world and you listen to them at the dinner table and you'd be thinking well can i go along with this i can go along with it except it depresses me right so so when people analyze the world in that way say like you know, it's, it's all bad in the sense of smash the patriarchy because it's just oppressing us. I do think, well, th- that makes me feel sad because I'm a man and I'm, you know, moulded in that conventional context of being a white male. Um, it just makes me feel sad, but it doesn't make, make me want to argue against it. It doesn't make me want to say, well, that's not true. Because the people who are analysing all this are in universities and they know a lot more than I do. But but how do I keep a sense of accommodating myself to modern ideas and also keeping light-hearted, light-hearted, you know, full of joy? And the way I do it, the trick I use is this thing called religion. And that's the only reason I use it. It's like a psychotherapy. It's like a... It's something that gives me a sense of well-being. I'm not doing it to evan- evangelize either myself or anybody else. I'm doing it because it's like a beautiful exercise. It's like yoga. Physical yoga is physical yoga. And mental guru yoga is what they call when you're doing a kind of a, a practice or an exercise in Buddhism where you're focusing on your mentor deity. It's a it's a yoga of the mind, you know. You're you're stretching the mind in a particular way, and if you do something really simple, like say a mantra, or say a prayer, right? If you take a Christian prayer, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the Living God, have mercy on me. That's the old Jesus prayer from the Gos, no, from the Desert Fathers onwards. You take that and you say that. And try and say it like, imagine you're an actor. And an actor has to kind of get inside the sentence and believe what they're saying so that the observer feels that it's it's real. Well, we all have this ability to be actors. And so one of the ways to work at prayer is to go inside a mantra, go inside that particular mantra that I've just said, or go inside you know, a prayer like the Hail Mary and say it over and over again, and you find that it changes your mind. You do, in a way, believe it, if you say it. Now, you'll have a side of your mind watching you which doesn't believe this, which is aware that you're doing this as a kind of an exercise, an experiment. But you will, in in the part of you that's embodying the words and saying the words, you will feel... You'll know it yourself. You'll know it's changing you. Just slightly. Just tiny. And if you took... Take a word like again... And this doesn't even have to be connected with any religion. 
but it's connected with them all. Take the idea of to say sorry or forgive me. So now I think of the phrase, I am sorry, please forgive me. Now imagine you're saying that to somebody that you may have offended. Just think of somebody. I can visualize immediately. It's funny the way when you mention theoretically somebody you may have offended, you, you, your mind immediately goes accurately to somebody that you have indeed offended. So I now have a mental picture of somebody in front of me that I offended in the past 12 months. And now I say to them, I am sorry I offended you. Please forgive me. And I kind of fantasized that. I kind of imagined them in front of me and me saying it to them. That is an amazing embodiment of words. And the words in some way allowed the embodiment to become real in the room, even though I'm alone. But it's still, because I've invoked the other person's presence, it still has a huge dynamic effect. And you begin to see how sensible it is within religious traditions that there's, there's always a kind of a an area or a, a psychological space of forgiveness and for asking forgiveness. You know, to say sorry is... It, it's done at the beginning of Mass, but it's done in Islam. Uh, it's done in, in Buddhism. Every religion has this dynamic of trying to say, I am sorry that I have offended you. And we know that's good therapy, because if you're in a relationship with children or with parents or with a, a beloved partner, you know that there are times you do offend them, and you know that the worst situation is where you don't let go. Where you feel you're being threatened. Right? You're being called out, let's say, for being angry. You get angry, let's say, at the dinner table. And you're being called out for being angry. And that really makes you more angry. And more defensive. And so you you dig your heels and you start defending maybe something you said which you know actually in your heart was wrong but you'll still defend it. And it's it's a strange stubbornness that's in the human mind. And it's amazing how that stubbornness is like you can dissolve it by saying something like, I'm sorry I said that. I don't know if you've ever been there where you actually do apologize spontaneously, right? So, so you say, so I've been there like where, you know, the kind of a conflict of language and you know I'm arguing against somebody else and it's a personal situation and it's a, and I can feel the temperature rising inside me and eventually I say something which is like you know my strongest most aggressive sentence and I say it and I know that the other person has gone silent and the they've received a slap the sentence that I have uttered, the aggressive, has hurt them and may even hurt them the most if it's true, if it's accurate. So I know now that I've said something which is really true, but it's very hurtful to have said it. I've said it to their face because I was angry myself. And then spontaneously maybe, I know, just quickly, it's like, it's like, don't go over the cliff, just quickly. And I stop myself and I say, I'm really sorry I said that. I'm sorry I called you that. I apologize. I'm sorry. You feel relief. You feel, it's like you've just avoided a train knocking you down. You know, it's like you're on the ledge in the subway or the underground. And you were just about to lose your balance and fall in front of the oncoming train and you just got your feet together at the right moment and stepped back. And there's a sense of relief that you didn't say it. No, that you took it back. So the dynamic of apology is very helpful. And every therapist knows that. And it seems to me that it makes common sense that 
you know, it was it was there in religions, different religions, for good effect, being able to say sorry. And even if you're not in a particular religious tradition, it's still really healing and helpful to to admit your mistakes and say sorry. I'll tell you where a, a really interesting place that happens, in my experience, was and is in teaching. I, I used to teach many, 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 many years ago in secondary school, for a short time I used to, to teach teenagers and I have been teaching adults in different places from universities to just the kind of workshops that I might do, art of memoir and people would come to a workshop. So I've, I, I have a long experience over decades of teaching with people and I find that one of the most powerful things you can do in teaching as a teacher is is never to try and get into the position where you know more than the the students and that always means saying things like I used to say even going into secondary school I would go into a class at the beginning of September and I would say there are people in this class who are smarter than me who are more intelligent than me and will end up with far more qualifications in life than I'd ever reach so let's establish that's the truth there's smarter people than me in this room that's a great kind of leveler that actually gives you permission to teach and I noticed that always worked with child rearing as well whether it was my own family or others I always noticed like if with young people in that you know you might be in the place of the parent in the family situation or whatever every time the young person asks you a question and you say I don't know you have given yourself brownie points. You have gone up in their estimation. And I think of, there's a young one I know at the moment, she'd be about 12 or 13 years of age. She's the daughter of a, a family, friends of ours. And sometimes we'd be at the table and she would be there. And she'd be watching you closely because she'd be hearing maybe the parents talking positively about you, you know. And then she'd be trying to assess you. And sometimes then she would challenge me with a direct question, you know. She'd ask me some informative detail about climate change, let's say. And I would say to her, I don't know the answer to that, to be honest. And I know that even though she wouldn't be smiling, she'd be still eyeballing me like a shark. I could, I'd be able to feel the fact that I had got a brownie point for admitting I don't know. And then to go further, we'll say in teaching, is to recognize sometimes that people in the room are smarter than you. And then finally, finally, when you're teaching, many is the time you make a mistake. Now, you could make a mistake about the curriculum. You could, you could say the wrong thing about, you know, when George Washington was born or for what reasons he was against the British. And then you go and look it up and you realize, Oh, I made a mistake there. And you go back into class the next day and you say, I was speaking yesterday about George Washington and I told you something that's wrong and I'm really sorry. I made a mistake. And you tell them that. It it doesn't lessen people's trust in you when you make mistakes. It actually brings it higher. Isn't that funny? Like, you want people to trust you in those professional situations. You want them to really rely on you as a credible authority on history. And yet... The way it happens is by showing them the times that you've made mistakes. Same thing with parents. It's exactly in the moments where you say, I'm not good at this, that you build up people's confidence in you. I used to say that about children. I'd say, I, I haven't a clue about children. I don't know how to rear a child. Now, it, it would bring up people's confidence. And again, also with children, it seems to me that you can be parenting and directive and clear about everything, but sometimes there's a need to apologize and sometimes there's a great value in your apology and saying, sorry, I got that wrong. Okay? Now that's, that's okay to the extent of regret, remorse, apology, 
and how it works well in psychotherapy and how it used to work well in in confession and in rituals of asking forgiveness that exist in various different religions but i'm going just one step further because there's a more basic idea in faith and that is whatever the religion is we are trying to formulate an idea of the human being in glory if you like you know in in perfection in glory the christ cosmically is a model and template which we are saying that we belong to as human beings this is our destiny as human beings forget about the kind of philosophical conversation whether that's true or not metaphysically but but just think as a kind of a an idea to aspire to to be so perfect poetically to be one with the cosmic christ that we are all temples of the spirit of god that we are all you know issuing infinite light of god like that's a, that's a hugely positive thing to say about human beings and then to say that that this is something when we say human being we we, we say male and female we say yin and yang one and the other so that the dynamic is the couple longing for each other loving each other is the template of infinite love of god's love if you want and i'm only using the word god because it works for christians well allah would work in islam and the al islam has the same the same idea it's coming from the same source the stories about creation and the idea that that the human being is made male and female as the image of god the icon of god you know that it's beautiful like you think about the icons that i have in the in the press here the the bookcase beside me i have an icon of the mother of jesus and i have an icon of christ that's what, that's all i have in it today because some of the others are up in donegal but but the, their images like you know you would identify the the madonna as as a, as a woman as a mother with a child a young boy beside her so they they're human images right and then they have gold halos in the icon tradition the, the the halo is painted they use gold leaf to make that and it's real gold gold leaf and then what happens is in the light that's coming in at the moment into this beautiful little room my studio shed in Leitrim there's a skylight window and an apex roof so the sun is coming in and down onto the bookcase and it illuminates the gold more than it illuminates you know the gold sends back the light to you more than the other pigments of color the purple you know the <clears throat> the, the mother of god has this purple veil around her head and <clears throat> it folds over her body and that that gold around her gives a great depth to her image but we still know to say that that's like a lens you know that in some sense obviously it's a piece of wood with painting on it every orthodox christian knows that but they they know that when they use it in a certain way when when you open your heart in like say a mantra or a prayer before that icon the icon is then becoming something else it's becoming a lens for the transcendent presence that is manifest in the mother of god the the woman who gave birth to jesus who who has all her life and then there's the dormition the going to sleep of mary the assumption of mary into heaven this is like theokratos the mother now of god extraordinary kind of words like we're just too familiar with it to to grasp the beauty of that idea 
A mother is a mother is a mother of God. It's a good, it's a good place. So when I use that icon, I know what it is, but it's it's functioning in a very powerful way for a very beautiful and sublime idea about an individual. Okay. But when I think about my own body and my own language and my own voice and my own movements, I'm saying, or yours, let me say yours more interestingly, let's think about your body, your face, your fingers. Just look at your hands at the moment. The body that you inhabit is the image, the reflection, the icon of God, of divinity, of, of that which sustains the universe and holds all things in being. And it's within you. And you are the supreme icon of that being. It's a pretty positive way to think about a human being. And if I go for a moment, allow me to go to Islam. Because Islam is so close to that, that it actually... Islam says that, you know, it, it's not a different religion from Judaism or Christianity. It's simply the affirmation of all that has already been revealed through Judaism and through Christianity. It's a summation of it, a completion of it. And in that sense, they don't so much focus on the individual icons, And they just focus on the presence, the presence of God. They say in Islam, everywhere I look, I see the face of God. Everywhere I look. I can use that sentence sometimes for quiet, relaxed meditation in the garden. I look out at the tree. And I can be like in my own ego thinking, that's a nice tree. And the next sentence is, and I planted it, and it's my tree. But the other level of consciousness is where you're entering into a consciousness that is like beyond your own ego. And the door into it is in the phrase, everywhere I look, I see the face of God. If you, if you practice that little sentence, you realize that it's drawing you out of your ego consciousness and into some kind of communion consciousness some some kind of connected consciousness whereby you and the tree are not connected mechanically but are the one thing because the ground of tree and the ground of you is one thing that's I suppose where you get Judaism and Christianity and Islam and then if you go all over to the East you find Buddhism saying very much the same thing except not necessarily naming what is transcendent as a God. And so I find in the different strands, the different religious traditions, there's different emphasis in, in different ones. It's like the complete transcendence, the awe of God's presence and how close it penetrates us. That dynamic, I think, is in Islam. And there are beautiful prayers in Islam. There's beautiful poetry, like the poetry of Rumi. And if you get your hands on that stuff and read it slowly and prayerfully, you will bring yourself to a very beautiful place of relaxation. Now, sometimes I think that Personally, I need almost like a bit more personality. So, so sometimes if, I, if I'm thinking about the saints, let's say, 
the whole communion of saints it's 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 like it's like ordinary people in a sense and christian prayer can be very very much like that you know an engagement with a sense of ordinary people who are like in a hierarchical fashion associated with other ordinary and then they're associated with other ordinary and you finally end up with the center of the circle as being Christ. And I say Christ then wider circle is you know apostles and saints and holy people. You gradually get out to your ancestors and to your mother and to your grandfather and the people that you say you hope are in heaven. So there's a real kind of folksy personality kind of feel to Christianity for me. Whereas whereas the the mosque and the Islamic tradition doesn't have so much emphasis on individual personality kind of you know, a whole middle management of heaven with different personalities. That's what that's what in a sense Catholicism has. It's it's this kind of huge middle management that you can really select the saint that suits you. And it's like you're talking to a mate. But that that is still the same as using any icon. You're, you're, you're opening your heart in prayer to something wider than the egoic self. This little trap of the egoic self that you're caught in as is just you. And, and you talk to St. Bridget, St. Teresa, St. Anthony, St. whoever you want. It, it actually just bring somebody else into the room and in that sense it brings you out of your egoic self and I'd make that argument for religion at that level because only because I've experienced it in my own life not because it necessarily is true or that there's some sort of big payoff if you join the club called Christians or Catholics or believers in God no I don't I don't go there I'm as comfortable with Dawkins as I am with any Christian philosopher. I think Dawkins is a Christian philosopher. I think he's profound. I mean, I you know, there's bits I don't like, he says as well. But but the dynamic is healthy for me because because it is healthy mentally. And I do come back sometimes to my anxieties about the different places you go and the choices you make, when you choose to look at the world through a lens of realism, that's a lovely tree. Rationally, why is it a lovely tree? Because it's this, that and the other. What's the history of the tree? I planted the tree. It's my tree. You can't get out of the egoic cage the ego center. You get trapped in it. And then if you look at some of the things that go on in the world, probably because we're more aware of what goes on in the world. I mean, they weren't aware globally of what went on in the world even 40 years ago. We used to get a few grainy pictures on the television of riots in America, but we barely knew what America was, and I used to fantasize about what would a color television look like. It used to amaze me that they had this thing in America called color television. I just didn't quite get it. And in the black and white of the news programs we watched in the late 1960s, we saw black and white images. But we didn't, we didn't get the full story. And we weren't as politicized about colonialism or the oppression of people. So, so that meant that, in a sense, we weren't as aware. And being aware of the injustices in the world can lead you to a career dedicated to changing the world for the better. That's, that's the people I admire. But there's a huge, that's about 5%. The other 95% become more aware, they become more frustrated, and they become more despairing. 
And that's only something I'm making an observation from anecdotal experience. That, that over the years, I have met so many people. You say, how are you doing? They say, I'm exhausted with this fracking. I'm exhausted with this, that or the other. They're worn out. And young people sometimes are worn out. And I do sometimes wonder, is there a connection between the mental health crisis among young people and the fact that they're living in a kind of an ego cage? They don't have a grammar of transcendence. They don't have a grammar of a metaphysics that says consciousness transcends your ego. And if you awaken that consciousness, you begin to see your life as an interconnected piece of a wider picture. They, they don't go there as much now in modern society as we used to. And because there's more information, we are all being flooded with so much negative stuff. It's like, it's like even the word dystopia and dystopian, you know, people talk about, let's say, the Handmaid's Tale as a dystopian drama. Now, if you said that to me 20 years ago, I wouldn't have known what you meant because I didn't know what the word dystopia meant. Now we kind of all know that dystopian is something like a meditation on it's going to get bad, you think it's bad now, it's going to get even worse. So, so what do you think is the antidote to that? And and that, if you've if you've stayed with this and you're still with me, I am coming to the one single thing I'd love to share this weekend with you. I'd love to, I'd love to give you this as a gift. I'd love to I'd love you to cherish this. I've never said that before. I'm saying it now. It's a beautiful July evening at the end of July. It's gorgeous. Even when it rains, it's gorgeous in the summertime. Now, there is so much suffering. I can't quantify it among seven billion people. There are people who would say that things have got better over the past 20 years, that there are more and more millions being taken out of poverty. But there's no point in getting into all the nitty-gritty. All I know is that if I'm living just in the kind of ego cage, and if I'm being flooded with this information, which is negative endlessly, it's going to have an effect on me. I am going to have a mental health problem. I'm going to get depressed. I'm going to feel just terrible. I'm going to feel down and bad. And what would do the trick of changing that for me I'm saying that for me religious faith changes everything even if it's not true don't be asking yourself like is it plausible to believe in God now that it's 2022 don't even ask that that's like sort of figuring out is what I'm doing acceptable to other people? Don't, don't think like that. Think, how does this improve you as a human being? And if going to Mass, which I don't do, by the way, don't ever get me wrong in this podcast. I'm, I'm just human. But I'm coming at religion in a new way, in a different way. I'm saying, look, it's like psychotherapy. If it helped you, if it made you feel better, if it made you function better as a human being with other people, then there's a great benefit in it. And the idea of believing in Allah, that everywhere I look I see the face of God, or believing that you can, you can access the, the kind of incarnated presence of God through, let's say, the Eucharist the divine services of the church. 
if you believe that in meditation you can deeply practice letting go of your ego and allowing this sense of compassion to awaken in you and it's something you practice to say in islam to say it's 18 inches from your head to your heart and that is the longest spiritual journey you'll ever make in your life from the head rationally to the heart to say in the orthodox christian tradition the noose the noose the knowing that is love the love in your heart the noose to, to say bring the mind down to the heart see it's exactly the same as as in islam exactly the same as in buddhism where they talk about bodhicitta you know compassionate mind and the compassionate mind the bodhicitta the noose all that sense of the heart living by the heart is the practice of prayer and is the practice of asking forgiveness and is the practice of gratefulness and prayers focusing on a mentor deity all the dynamics that you do in a religious practice privately in the privacy of your own room or walking along the road to give thanks to God to feel a presence that transcends and is beyond your little mind your little ego to look at the tree and, and feel not rationally about it but emotionally a presence it is the face of God God smiling at you thank you hello say your prayers to the tree under the tree be present in the moment okay but also be present and then pray use the language of Christianity or use the language of Buddhism or Hinduism or Judaism anything these are all beautiful rivers of wisdom and don't do it thinking well this is drawing you into sort of an ideological world where you have to obey moralities and all this crack no forget about it leave that old language of morality alone use the language of psychotherapy think about it as a well-beingness in yourself allowing your mind to come into your heart allowing yourself to experience compassion and love reaching out to other people and practicing practicing the mantra whether it be in islam they they use allah as a mantra umani padma hum the same buddhism but they're in buddhism now in tibetan buddhism there's so many mantras you can pick lovely ones that you know focus on Tara the female Buddha whatever and in Christianity again there are so many phrases that are actually mantras prayers we call them I suppose in the Christian tradition so whichever tradition it is try it just try it really simple not going to the churches necessarily but just kind of finding a way to open your heart for a few moments in the morning or in the evening or in the middle of the day like there is no rules to religion actually there's no rules to it it's just like breathing and it's just like sometimes breathe consciously sometimes breathe prayerfully prayerfully is gratefully gratefully is prayerfully it's as simple as that and yet the tiniest little practices will actually change you psychologically as a person. And the big one that I was talking about earlier is that one of saying sorry. You can say sorry to people that you've hurt. You can say sorry to students or young people that you have misdirected. And you can say, I'm sorry. And you will immediately find a sense of relief in your heart a, a, a weight will have been taken off your shoulders you'll feel like 
you nearly fell into the way of a big train and you just stepped back and you didn't. That's what saying sorry feels like. It's a beautiful release. And again, I suppose what I'm saying is you can practice that alone. Visualize somebody you've hurt or that you feel angry with or whatever. Visualize them alone. Bring them into the presence of, let's say, your Buddhist shrine or your Christian icons. Bring them there and and just say the words. Say them out loud. Embody the words. I think it's hugely important to get the words out of your, your brain. If it's just in your head, it never really lives. When you, when you speak with your lips, then it's in your heart. The heart comes out and is spoken. It's like a, it's like a, it has a physicality to it. You know, it's like, it's like your heartbeat, the pulse of your heart, they say, is like, is like the first uttering of the word Allah, Allah. It's the first uttering of God's presence is actually your heart pumping in, out, in, out. It's like the presence. So you say out, I'm sorry I hurt you. Please forgive me. If you do that privately, it's amazing how if you did it half a dozen times over a week because you had somebody in your head that you felt you had offended and then after a week that person phones up just accidentally. You'd laugh. I know, you'd laugh because you'd feel a kind of relief. You'd feel, you'd feel, hello, Joe, how are you? Because you've, you've been doing something secret. You've been trying to find in your heart a way to say, sorry, Joe. And if you've done it as a ritual, there's every likelihood that it'll come spontaneously to you. You know, before you know it, on the phone with the real Joe, you'll be saying, you know, Joe, do you remember that thing I said to you last week? I'm really sorry, but that I shouldn't have said that. Blah, blah, blah. And we're all back to a good energy. We're all back to a kind of a loving energy. So, I would really thank you for being here. I'd really thank you also for being here in some sense, I dare say, because my voice is present with you, but there's something deeper now present with you, and that is the transcendent, kind of awakened conscious being and you can name that through any different religious tradition you want but you know it and it knows you that presence is like an embrace and it's coming at you it's coming lovingly to you It's a relationship. It's not just you and me in the room. Maybe that's what's hugely different about this particular podcast at the end of July 2023. So I always say thank you for being here. Because there's you and me. But there is also a third. There's a third presence. And when I stop speaking and you look at the environment around you, you can acknowledge that presence remains with you. Thank you for being here. Bye-bye.